Take your Bibles tonight and turn, please, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38. One of the most familiar portions of Scripture with regard to the end times. Let me tell you where we're going and uh, kind of lay out before you a path for the brief future. First of all, I'd like to say that we will spend a couple more weeks looking at this subject on Sunday evenings. I'd like to close two weeks from tonight looking at Matthew 24. And Jesus in Matthew 24 said there's only one sign of his coming. Only one. To the Jews, he reminded them of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And that will occur in the middle of the tribulation period. He did not give a sign of the beginning. He gave a sign of the end. And so much of what we deal with when we talk about prophecy is really not church prophecy. It is Jewish prophecy. And I think it would be very helpful if in your own mind you would adopt the mentality that prophecy is about Israel, not about the church. The scripture teaches that the church will be raptured without a sign. Amen. No warning, unexpected by the society in which we live, and truthfully, the entire society will find it's over before it gets started. I've had people say to me from time to time, will America be in Bible prophecy? Well, if we have, and I don't know for sure that the number I'm about to give, but generally speaking among scholars and sociologists who look at the subject of the church, the true church, not just the visible church, if 17% of the church is truly born again. A little under one in five. But if 20% of the visible church were removed, no matter which way you cut it, America's economy and America politically would be in a mess. And so we have pushed the envelope to the edge of the table. Um, I'm not in despair over America, but I would be lying if I told you my hope was America. It is not America. It is only the Lord Jesus Christ and only the sovereign work of God. But with that happening, America being in shambles, I can very easily see how that several possibilities might happen. One world government would become a very real need at the time. Secondly, what you and I have known of godly influence from the believing church. And when I say godly influence, for example, and I'm not a one-string band, as you know, but just taking the issue of abortion that issue would be a non-issue in the culture. And so what is going to happen is the influence for the culture to live by the Ten Commandments is going to be out the window. And so truthfully, for our children and grandchildren, I have concerns. Concerns for their salvation. By the same token, I think that we forget the Bible says all that live godly in Christ Jesus, except those who live in the 21st century, will suffer persecution. I think we have to acknowledge that what we expect is not realistic, and it is not biblical. And our children have to establish that they believe the faith that we have taught them. I have children, grandchildren, and now a couple of great-grandchildren on the way, a great-grandchild. I say a couple on the way. Maybe I should correct that. I have one born, one on the way, and one planning on having one on the way. How does that sound? 
And I'm here to tell you that I, just like you, fear for the world that we are leaving them. I can't change America with politics, but I do believe this. If God is in charge, I don't care how deep this hole that we dig or we see being dug, I cannot believe that God is not on the throne. And I become perturbed with people that actually react and they grab their political arms and they're going to stop it. And I assure you, they haven't stopped it in 50 years. This is not a new battle. We've been fighting. Go back for just the issue I just mentioned. How far back does abortion go? 1973. We're almost 50 years fighting that same battle. We haven't won it yet. What in the world is in our mind? Paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. He never thought of politics. It was never an issue with the apostle. He always looked to the authority of Scripture and the sovereign purposes of God in the ages. Well, tonight we come to Ezekiel 38, and I'd like us to open our Bibles there. And I've entitled what we're going to look at, and it will move rather quickly. That's why you have a handout. If you have questions when we're finished, you can see me after the rapture, and we'll discuss them. Ezekiel chapter 38, I'd like us to begin tonight reading at verse 18. Let me tell you what's happened through the first 17 verses. We will look at them a little bit later. But you have an assembly of nations that are going to come against the nation of Israel. These nations are primarily from the north of Israel. If you look on the screen behind me, You'll notice in the upper hand, in the upper side of the globe, primarily you are looking from what we know as Turkey all the way through Armenia, and then further to the east, the old Assyrian, Babylonian, uh, Persian empires, and those people are going to unite with according to the book of Ezekiel 38, a couple of other groups. An army will come from Libya, an army will come from Ethiopia, and an army will come from Arabia. And you'll notice what's not mentioned. Syria is not mentioned. Jordan is not mentioned. In the battle that takes place, the collar nations are not the centerpiece it stepped beyond them. And so if you look at Ezekiel 38, as they come against the nation of Israel, verse 18, God speaks. The Bible says, And it will come to pass at the same time, when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and fire of wrath, I have spoken. Pause. What is God jealous of the most? God is not jealous of another being. He is not jealous of idols. The thing God is most jealous of is being who he is. Don't misrepresent me. Don't take what you call my love beyond the limits of Scripture. Don't take my authority and power beyond what I have revealed in the Scripture. God is not limited by the Scripture, but God knows where he has drawn his own limits, and Scripture reveals that. So when the Scripture speaks, God says, I want you to know I will always be true to myself. Verse 19 <clears throat> Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. 
The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. The power of this earthquake is going to basically take the nation of Israel and reshape Israel as we know it. Verse 21. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord. Listen to this. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. Do you realize that what God just told us is in this battle when God comes, just like in the book of uh, Judges, when the Midianites came against Israel and Gideon and 300 stopped them, the Midianites turned on themselves and fought each other. That is exactly what you just read. God says this army is going to turn on itself. That tells me a couple of things. Number one, they may not all speak the same exact language. They certainly cannot have one commander. And it tells me their loyalty to one another is limited it is not absolute, total surrender and loyalty to one common thing. Something united them, but not absolute loyalty because they can turn on each other in the middle of the heat of the battle. Verse 22. And I will bring him, Gog, to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. What gunshot was fired? What cannon shot? What missile? What atomic weaponry? None. To put it in simple terms, in verse 32, this battle ends before it ever begins. There is no defense by Israel. God himself stops the army of Gog in this chapter. Verse 23, listen to this. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and will be known in the eyes of many nations. They, then they shall know that I am the Lord. A couple of things that I think are important and then we're going to walk through this passage if you will remember, before Jesus Christ returns in his glory at the end of the tribulation period, the nation of Israel has had God somehow work in their midst. And what God does is by how he sovereignly works in front of them, the nation of Israel, which is not godly. Remember a few weeks ago I gave you a statistic only 22% of all Jews believe that God is alive. Most Jews are atheists. Now, I realize how the uh, Holocaust played into this and recent world events amplified it. No question about it. But the important point is, it's obvious that when you come to the tribulation period, Think in your mind, by Revelation chapter 7, I've got 144,000 flaming evangelists. What turned them? Somehow I am convinced that this event plays into that. And so tonight I'd like us to look at this famous battle, the battle of Gog, of Magog. And notice, if you would, there are a number of nations that are mentioned. I'm going to read if you would follow along in your Bibles, verses 1 through 12. Now the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, who is the leader of this band, Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, or chief prince, Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great army with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. 
Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer with all its troops, the house of Tagarma from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days, God is speaking to Israel through Ezekiel. Notice, after many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. Pause. This battle has to be a prophetic future. It is not a past battle. Why? Well, among other things, the nation of Israel has not been in the land since A.D. 70. Rome ran them out of the land, and they were scattered. And in 135 A.D., Hadrian took the land and renamed it, if you'll remember. He chose the Latin name for Philistine, which becomes Palestine, and most of us call it Palestine, which is really Philistine. And so the Jews have not been there. Here the Jews have returned, and not only have they returned from many nations, there's a sense of safety, of security. That becomes a problem as to when this battle is actually fought, and we'll talk about that tonight. Notice, if you will, verse 9, you will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that the thoughts will arise in your mind that, and you will make an evil plan. Listen carefully. Here's the plan of all of these nations. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. Walls in the days of the Bible, were intended to keep enemies out. So the nation feels secure and doesn't need to be defended. With all due respect, some people have said, well, that must be the Iron Dome. The Iron Dome does not fit this description totally. You will say, I will go up against a land of un." walled villages, I will go up to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. Stop. Having no system of defense. What you're seeing today doesn't fit that bill. In fact, if you've been to Israel, and some of you have, you know that around all of the Palestinian cities, are stone walls that are 30 feet tall. God says the nation of Israel will not need that kind of a defense when this takes place. And it doesn't exactly fit the present tense as we know it. What is the purpose of their coming? Look at verse 12. Very clearly and very simply, to take plunder and to take booty to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Verse 13, you are joined by Sheba and Dedan, which are actually Saudi Arabia, and the merchants of Tarshish, and the merchants of Tarshish are actually the merchants of Tyre. Tyre is on the coast of Lebanon. So you're joined by Lebanon, you're joined by Arabia. Have you come to take blunder, plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take a great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when Israel, my people, dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north. 
you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. And let me stop. Most of us, if we heard that an army were coming on horses, we would say this is a backward nation. This is a backward war. It all depends on how much we fear nuclear warfare. The government of the United States, with a number of other governments, is very concerned about the fact that nuclear warfare can very easily get out of control. And there are treaties constantly being written and attempted to be forced even on newer nations that want to have nuclear weapons. Because the fear is that we are actually capable now of destroying the entire world. And so, as a result, it is quite possible that what we know as historic means of warfare, in particular a cavalry, as you see here, foot soldiers, that that may be used. The Bible may not be exaggerating. It may not be metaphorically speaking. It may be literally speaking of a kind of warfare due to the particular strange circumstances. Verse 16, you will come against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me. Whom I am hallowed, pardon me, when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are you of whom I have spoken in the former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them. And so let's begin to look at this particular scene. Your notes, even though they may not visually look like mine, you have all of the information except for uh, some charts that I just could not put in to your notes. What are the invading nations? Most of us have heard the invading nations are actually Russia. That's been the number one. In fact, I can hear in my head while I'm talking Jack Van Empe back in 1972 saying that in verse number two, the prince of Rosh is the chief prince of Russia. And so there are people who have, because of our view of the world, they have actually believed that this is Russia invading Israel. I don't believe that's what the Bible says. So someone says, do you not believe that Russia will be involved in the end times? Oh, I do. As a background ally to the Arab peoples. That's all. America as a background nation to the nation of Israel. And even that is on shaky ground right now. So if you look at the map, notice the map actually begins to give you a perspective on where these nations come from. Gomer in this map, and some of these maps actually go back, and you'll see in a moment, 150 years ago. I wanted ancient maps because what we've done in the last 50 years, we moved the maps. They didn't move, but we moved them. Gomer would be in what you know as the Balkan territory in this map. Magog is actually from the Caucasus Mountains. If you look at a map today, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, you have the Caucasus Mountains, and that's the chief place where these enemies come from. Magog comes from right there. That is the territory that is known as the Stands in Russia. For example, you have Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, uh, you have Kazakhstan, which is actually to the uh, west, uh, east, pardon me. Then you see Meshek and Tubal are actually in Turkey. Tagarma is in Azerbaijan. Persia today is Iran and Iraq. And then you have to the south, Kush, which speaks of the people of Africa, in particular here, Ethiopia. And then you have Libya and you have Put. It appears from the text that the text is telling us the nations actually are the northern Islamic nations. Not the nations that we've generally heard stir up trouble, but a different set of nations. 
Here is an old map, and it has the names of these various nations. And notice Anatolia, or Turkey is how we know it, Meshach, Gomer, Magog, Tubal, and Tagarma are all part of Turkey. Javan is actually the Greek people, and the Greeks settled on both sides of the Aegean Sea. They were in Greece, and then Alexander the Great conquered Turkey and moved his army east. So you have Javan people, descendants of Javan, who are actually in Greece and Turkey. Tyrus is actually Tyre in the Bible on the coast of Lebanon at the Mediterranean Sea. Where is the major scene of this battle? Well, if you've been to Israel, the mountains of Israel, that term when it is used, is only used of two possible places. If you look at a map from the sky, an aerial view of Israel, there are mountains just at the coastline of the Jordan River. The Jordan River is commonly referred to as the Jordan Rift. And all of the waters from all of those northern countries flow into this particular place, end at the Dead Sea. But the most common use of the terms mountains of Israel would be north of the Sea of Galilee. On the map that is behind me, give me a moment, this is the Sea of Galilee. And the place that these nations are defeated by a divine act of God is actually north in those mountains, in that mountainous terrain between Israel and Lebanon and Syria, actually to the northeast. That's the place the Bible describes as the defeat of these nations. Now, some background. Deuteronomy 4, this was the promise God made to Israel, and this is a foundation for Ezekiel 38. Deuteronomy 4, verse 30, God says, When you are in distress, and all these things have happened to you, that in the latter days you will return to the Lord and obey him. God promised Israel that they would leave the land. They have left the land three times. They have only now returned the third time. The first time they left was when they left with Jacob and all of Joseph's sons, and they went to Egypt. And then the exodus takes place, and they come back for the first time. The second time occurred in 600 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar came in, conquered the city of Babylon, and between 605 B.C., 597, and 586 B.C., on three different occasions, conquered the Jews, carried them off to Babylon. They returned a second time. They were carried off into captivity a third time when Rome came in and on the exact same calendar day defeated Jerusalem as Babylon had defeated Jerusalem. And they were carried off into captivity a third time. They have been returning for basically about 125 years. The text, if you'll notice on the screen behind me, tells us that this return will happen in distress. The distress, we believe, actually has been what has occurred in the last hundred years. It is going to culminate in the tribulation period. In the present tense, we remember very clearly the Holocaust was the thing that really brought about the nation of Israel. More than anything else, guilt in the West over what we had allowed to take place in Germany is why we actually stood for the state of Israel to come into existence. The tribulation is often referred to as the 70th week of Daniel, and the last half of the tribulation is called the abomination of desolation or the time of Jacob's trouble. All of those are Old Testament symbolic terms. Now, I think it's important for me to draw to your attention this story is not history. This record of these nations coming against Israel is not history. It has to be prophecy for a couple of reasons. Notice on the screen. Never in world history 
of all of the nations listed in Ezekiel 38, never have they united against Israel. At no time has this specific group of people been destroyed by inclement weather, and that inclement is misspelled, so don't come to me afterwards. It's spelled right in your notes. The guy who wrote that, I need to talk with him about his spelling. Further, if you read Ezekiel 39, and we will not, but Ezekiel 39 tells us a couple of very interesting things. After God destroys this army in the mountains of Israel, in what may be called the Beka Valley, Israel is going to be taking the instruments of their warfare, their armaments, and for seven years it will be used as fuel in the nation of Israel. That's where we have a problem figuring out when this battle took, takes place. That is the problem. Do not forget that throughout the evening. That's the linchpin in this whole story. Because Israel has to have seven years to burn the instruments. And that, that those instruments are burned. Notice, if you will, they are found at a town called Hamona. It doesn't exist yet. So somehow, whenever this is describing this battle, it is not describing the present circumstance. Believe it or not, Bible theologians, after the gospel, don't always agree on a lot. When it comes to the gospel, we're pretty clear on that. But when it comes to the second coming, boy, I'm telling you, we're all over the page, which you're about to see. When does this battle take place? Well, a couple of things we know. Number one, Ezekiel 36, verse 24, Israel has to be regathered and the state of Israel has to be reinstituted. That happened May the 14th, 1948. So that's one factor. But more importantly, the text tells us that they come for plunder. That's all they're coming for. They're not coming in this case to conquer like they are in some other situations. In this case, it's very clearly about money. So that tells me that the nation of Israel has to have enemies that want to take from her, and they have to be willing to unite. Islam is the most logical possibility. But secondly... Israel itself today is the wealthiest nation in the Mideast. Not because of oil, but because they have taken the ground and they have basically brought forth from the ground every potential possibility for wealth and goods. And very interestingly, two things have happened in the last 20 years. Off the coast of Haifa, in Haifa Bay, they have found oil. Secondly, at the foot of Mount Hermon, or Hermon, they have found oil. So Israel has wealth that these nations actually want possession of. And this text tells us it's really about money. It's about greed. If you took a poll in the Mideast, you would be surprised to know that the greatest reason that the Arabs, the Arab world hates Israel, is because of how they have made the land to be fruitful, to produce as it's doing. It's pure jealousy. In Ezekiel 38, verse number 11, the Bible tells us that these nations unite, and here's what they say. You will say, I will invade a land of unwalled villages, not necessarily looking for another nation to attack them, feeling secure, without the need of walls of defense. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people. Well, let me ask you a question. Is Israel today unsuspecting? No. I can tell you right now they're not. In fact, very interestingly, the nation of Israel looks at itself, and you'll notice on the screen, they see 336 million Islamic peoples committed to their destruction. 
If you think of America and all of our advances in science, you would not realize how much America has partnered with Israel. And brilliant Israeli scientists are the ones who created what we have often used, and then we have had a discount provided it for Israel's defense, Iron Dome being one prime example. Because the nations around Israel are committed to her destruction, it is for that reason I am convinced that before Ezekiel 38 can take place, there is another war that has to be fought. In Isaiah 17 and Psalm 83, the Bible tells us of the nations that unite against Israel are defeated and Israel literally pushes its borders back. Much of what you know as Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and even into the northwestern portions of Saudi Arabia are actually scheduled to become territory that the nation of Israel will possess. That exterior land is what gives them the sense of security that they do not have to fear waking up like they did on the Yom Kippur War. When will Gog and Magog appear? Look at the screen, and I actually have six different opinions. I know, you say, it's bad enough if we got one. Why in the world did you give us six? Because you're going to encounter them if you do much reading. You might as well know they exist. Notice, if you will, and I'm going to walk through them and use a slight different picture. You do not have this. You have that last list. One position is after the tribulation period, but before the millennium. In other words, there is a gap between the tribulation period and the return of Jesus Christ. That is one position, and for very valid reasons, and you'll see why. A second position, and I'm working from the millennium forward. The second view says, no, it's not after the millennium. It's in, I'm sorry, after the tribulation. It's in the tribulation, but at the end of the tribulation. It's the same thing as the Battle of Armageddon. No, it's not the same thing as the Battle of Armageddon, and there's some reasons why. It's at the beginning of the tribulation period. Well, if the tribulation period is seven years, and if you want to place this battle in the first half of the tribulation period, could you explain to me why seven years Israel is burning fuel? That means they're burning it into the millennium. That doesn't fit the description the Bible gives us of the millennium. Well, all right, we'll go ahead and step forward. It's actually during the tribulation period, but we're not exactly sure where. Maybe it's day one of the tribulation period. Or maybe it's after the rapture and before the tribulation. There must be a gap of time in there. Or maybe it's actually before the rapture and before the tribulation. So if you'll notice in the notes that were given to you, Here's view number one. After the tribulation period, but before the millennium. So in your mind, draw a picture. Tribulation ends, millennium begins, and there must be in the minds of some teachers a gap of time between the two. Jesus Christ returns, fights the battle of Armageddon. This group says somewhere in here is the battle of Gog and Magog before the millennium. There are some problems, even though there are some good reasons to consider this. Number one, here's a good reason to consider it. This is a consistent argument with the view that there is an interlude of time between the rapture and the tribulation period. Number two, Ezekiel 38 requires Israel living unsuspecting and in peace uh, before Gog or Magog could easily come after the second coming. Jesus comes. Once he comes, Israel is secure. And so maybe that's the point. 
The third thing they argue is this. An interlude of time could be any length of time, even seven years. Since in Ezekiel 39, verse 9, they burn the enemy's weapons for fuel for seven years. So now we've got a seven-year tribulation period. And this group says we have a seven-year period in between and then a millennium. But there are some problems. Problem number one. If Jesus defeats all the enemies of Israel at Armageddon, what armies left to invade? Well, I don't know. I don't either. That's a problem. Number two. When Jesus returns, there is no Gog Magog invasion needed to get Israel to acknowledge that God is God. Go back, if you will, for a moment and notice, if you will, in Ezekiel chapter 39. Ezekiel 39, notice verse 22. Ezekiel 39, verse 22. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. Verse 29, and I will not hide my face from the Jews them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. It doesn't make sense. Pick the Bible up. There's only one place where the Bible gives us a gap of time. Not after the tribulation, not before the millennium, but at the end of the tribulation period, there is a time gap. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Daniel, chapter number 12. Daniel, chapter 12. Notice, if you would, please, Daniel chapter 12. Listen carefully in Daniel 12. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up. There shall be 1,200 and what? If you know your Bible, you know that the middle of the tribulation period to the very end is 1,260 days. 42 months. 42 lunar months, 30-day months, 1,260 days. That's very clear. Then why does Daniel add 30 days? The answer, very simply and logically. The 30 days in verse 11 is for the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25. Matthew 25 fits into verse 11. The nations are judged to enter the kingdom. Notice verse 12 goes on to say this. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. And someone says, oh, brother, more numbers. Guess what? It's 75 days. Jesus comes back, the battle of Armageddon, 30 days to judge the nation. Why do you need 75 days? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever asked the question, why in an election? Do you have a president elected in November? And it's not till the middle of January, January the 20th, that he actually takes office. He is given 75 days to set up his government. It may surprise you to know this, but in the early days of American history, that's right there. That passage is where they came up with that number. It's not fly by the seat of your pants. And so 
The 75 days is to give time to establish how the government will be run. Daniel 12 to 12, blessed is he who waits and reaches the end, 1,335 days. 75 days will most likely be used to judge the world, sheep and goat, and rebuild the planet to establish his government of this world. After the 75 days, the seven months needed to bury Gog and Magog invaders' bodies. Wait a minute. After? That's what this group says. Nor do they need seven years to burn the weapons. I don't believe the millennium is when this takes place. Well, someone says, well, it's not after the tribulation period. It's at the end. It's actually the same battle as the Battle of Armageddon. Let me ask you some questions. How many of you remember, when does the Battle of Armageddon take place? Don't all answer at once. When does the Battle of Armageddon take place? It takes place at the end of the tribulation period. Revelation chapter 16 through 19. Now here's the question. Who do the armies fight in the battle of Armageddon? I don't know who said it, but Jesus Christ. They resist his return. It's not a battle against Israel at this point. This is a battle against Jesus Christ. These nations are not all the nations of the world. Ezekiel 38 is a select group of nations. Those nations are destroyed by God. In the battle of Armageddon, I would remind you, Revelation chapter 19, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And by the word of his mouth, he destroys. Well, Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Zechariah chapter 14 tells us that when he speaks, their bodies literally melt. How many of you have seen the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark? I understand most of you have seen it, but you wouldn't dare say it right now. But that famous scene that they created where those men opened the ark and all of a sudden their bodies just melt, that was created from Zechariah's prophecy of what will happen when Jesus returns. Is that how the battle of Gog Magog ends? No. There is no son of God. There is no melting of their skin. It is the earthquake and the raining of rain, hail, fire, brimstone from heaven in the northern portion of Galilee. Where's the battle of Armageddon fought? The valley of Jezreel. Where's the valley of Jezreel? It's 50 miles south of this valley, the Bekaa Valley. In fact, the Battle of Armageddon, according to the Bible, is 1,440 furlongs. Which, if you read the scripture, the Battle of Armageddon actually starts at the Valley of Jezreel and goes all the way through Israel, through the Judean desert, into the land of Jordan, past the city of Basra, all the way to Petra, 186 miles. These two are not the same battle. The reason I'm moving this along is because I'm trying to not bury you. I'm afraid I'll lose you. Someone said, you lost me before you ever got started. I'm quickly speeding through this for your benefit. You can read more on your own. Notice this, the nations don't match. All nations come against Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19. In this battle, not all nations come. It's only a select group, and I've listed them on the screen. Kazakhstan, Kajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkestan, Tajikistan, Russia, meaning southern Russia, that uh, uh, Islamic portion of Russia, Turkey, Iran, Sudan, Libya, Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Algeria, and Tunisia. Those are the nations that come in this battle. They're not one and the same. 
Ezekiel 38 is not the battle of Armageddon. The locations don't match the same. The mountains of Israel and the valley of Jezreel and the valley of Jezreel southeast all the way to Petra. Two different geographical locations. The defeat is not the same. The defeat in Ezekiel 38 is torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur, as well as infighting. Verse 22. Armageddon, Jesus Christ speaks, and he does all the destroying. And then, how can Israel be at peace at the end of the tribulation period? Think this through. From the middle of the tribulation period to the end of the tribulation period, Ezekiel is running. Why is she running? Because the Antichrist is committed to her destruction. Well, where is, he, where is Israel going to find the time to burn all these armaments? It does not make sense. Someone says, well, maybe we need to make another change. Maybe we need to consider the fact that this battle is not fought at the end of the tribulation period, but maybe it's fought in the millennium. I know this sounds crazy. How many of you know the name of Arno C. Gabelein? A.C. Gabelein, at the turn of the last century, is probably one of the greatest prophecy preachers in America. This was his position. Well, how can this battle be fought in the millennium? Will there be enemies of Israel in the millennium? I don't think so. Will Israel need divine protection in the millennium with Jesus Christ on the throne? I don't think so. Will the Islamic nations exist in the millennium? My answer to the question is absolutely not. There will be no pagan religion. Jesus Christ, when he returns, all of the nations come together and he starts the world with a God-centered, Bible-centered, Christ-centered, cross-centered message. And that's how the millennium begins. This position does not make sense to me, but it was A.C. Gibson's position. And you say, why did he hold that? Well, turn, if you will, to the book of Revelation. Just so you know, the guy was not off the wall. This is a Bible scholar, not an idiot. Notice, if you would, please, Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. Do you remember these words? After the millennium, the thousand years, verse 6, verse 7, Revelation chapter 20. Now when the thousand years have expired. What does expired mean? This is not a charismatic meeting, just to give me the answer. Thank you for end. The thousand years is over. So we're after the millennium. Now listen to what it says. I didn't say this, the text says it. Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. So after the millennium, there will be a group of nations that Satan will unite against Jesus Christ. But that's not Ezekiel 38. The difference is that this group of nations is led by a human leader. The battle after the millennium is led by Satan. This is a group of nations wanting money. This battle in Revelation after the millennium is about removing Jesus Christ from the throne. All that is the same is the name of the leader and the center of his power. And while there is some possibility of duplication... There is no confirmation it is exact. Two different battles. Let me move on and talk about what I think are the proper positions. 
Those of you who know John Walford from Dallas, Dwight Pentecost, Charles Ryrie, and then some of you may know Herman White from Moody, I believe, and then Mark Hitchcock from Oklahoma, if my memory is correct. All of them said it's the first half of the tribulation. My answer very simply is this. This battle cannot be fought in the first half of the tribulation. I don't care how much you want it to. You've got to come up with seven years for them to be burning the materials. And if the last three and a half years of the tribulation, they are running for their lives, you can't have them collecting materials from the battlefield. So I don't believe it's during the tribulation, which brings me to what I think I'd like to focus on for just a few minutes before I let you go. There are only two realistic possibilities that make sense. Number one, after the rapture, but before the tribulation. In other words, rapture here, tribulation begins here, and somewhere in between this position, Ezekiel 38. This is the position of Tommy Ice with the Pre-Trib uh, Research Center. He says, and I'm just going to walk you through his arguments, with the world in chaos from the rapture, a Muslim coalition could seize the opportunity to attack Israel. And with the Muslim Gog Magog nations out of the picture just before the tribulation, the Antichrist would have an easier time making a peace covenant with the nation of Israel. Number three. He reminds us with the historic Christianized nations, like America, in tatters due to the rapture and the Islamic world in ruins from Gog Magog, the remaining world power could fill the Mideast vacuum. Those who have taught that Rome or Europe is the source of the Antichrist, this position would fit very well. Let me take it a step further. By a treaty with Israel, the conquest of the former Muslim nations, a Roman Empire just might be revived. Other world powers would be under the Antichrist. That's what Revelation 16 tells us. The nations of the East will all be under the Antichrist. With the Muslim world in tatters, Israel would have no resistance to building a temple to start the tribulation period. He says, the rapture does not start the tribulation, but rather the signing of the covenant. And let me say this, it took me 20 years in the ministry and 20 years of prophecy study to come to the realization that statement is right. The rapture does not start the tribulation. The Bible nowhere says that. That's a commonly held position, but it's wrong. The only thing the Bible tells us that starts the tribulation is when the Antichrist signs a covenant with the nation of Israel, and it is a seven-year covenant. And in the middle of it, he'll break the covenant. This, Dr. I says, would allow three and a half years before the middle of the tribulation, giving Israel a full seven years to burn the weapons before being forced to flee. But there are some problems. Would placing the invasion before the tribulation contradict latter years and last days? Pick the Bible up and many of us struggle when we read in a passage the last days, the latter years. For example, listen to this passage. God who at various times and in diverse different manners spoke to our fathers in time past by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us in his son. You see, the term last days has a church meaning and it has a Jewish meaning. And I better be very careful that when I'm reading last days, it's Jewish last days, not church last days. They are not one and the same. Number two, 
A peaceful precondition is important for this battle. Israel living unsuspecting and in peace before Gog Magog may only occur because of the peace covenant with the Antichrist who isn't revealed before the tribulation. So he holds to the fact that it is that covenant that gives Israel security to not need walls. If Gog Magog happened closer to the midpoint, a question is raised. Why would God rescue Israel so dramatically in the first half of the tribulation period to immediately hand them over to the Antichrist in the last half? Which brings me to the one conclusion I have to come to. And that is that before the rapture or the tribulation period, this has to take place. This is the position of Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, who've written the Left Behind series, if you would read that. This is their position. It is also the view of Joel Rosenberg, who was a CIA intelligence agent for the government and has written a number of books on Mideast prophecy and Mideast politics. His book, Epicenter, taught this. The advantages, seven years before Israel, I'm sorry, seven years for Israel to burn the weapons from the invaders is important. That would allow the 70th week of Daniel to not be a problem. Number two, with this battle fought before the rapture, the Muslim world would be in ruins and their faith in Allah shattered from the defeat of Gog Magog. Israel would no longer have an impediment to rebuild the temple. Number three, God declaring himself in his nature, and you'll remember we read in Ezekiel 38 earlier that what God does is he destroys these nations to prove he's God. The argument is that a multitude of people could turn to God, trust Christ, revealing God himself as the victor in the Gog-Magog war and resulting in more people saved and raptured and escaping the wrath of the tribulation period. But there are some problems. The problem is, what does latter years and latter days mean? Most people would say it's only the tribulation period. Number two, placing the invasion before the rapture is contradictory for Israel living in unsuspecting peace. It is. Unless Psalm 83 and Isaiah 17 refer to a war that pushes the enemies back. And that's the reason why I feel that I have to cover that because those two passages tell us that Israel is going to push their enemies and their borders back. That's what gives Israel the security, I believe. So, in other words, you're saying that there's going to be another war. Yeah. But remember this. How long did the Yom Kippur War last? Six days. How long did the invasion of Israel in 1967 last? Seven days. We're not talking about years. This can happen very quickly, and I believe it will happen quickly. Israel is certainly ready to defend herself. The only problem we have is this, and this is a problem. The Bible says that for the church, there are no signs of the rapture. So as a Christian, I'm not looking for signs. I don't care what's going on in the Mideast. I don't care what's going on in the UN. I don't care what's going on in the Catholic Church. I don't care what's going on with America's government. They don't mean a thing to me. I'm listening for one thing, the sound of the trumpet. That's it. Nothing else matters. Here's the problem. We're too focused on geopolitics and not enough focused on what Jesus said we're to look up. Lift our eyes up, our redemption draws nigh. You see, the truth of the matter is, prophecy is about Israel. 
And if I really believe that, I don't need to know about Psalm 83 and Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38. I need to know because as an American, I'm asking for my kids and my grandkids. That's the real reason. But when it comes to whether or not I'm looking for Christ to return, there is not a single thing to keep it from happening other than the decree of Almighty God. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, as we come to you tonight, we realize that some of the things that are revealed in your word are, as the Apostle Peter said, hard to be understood. And the important issue is not do we understand it all. The important issue is do we have the proper perspective the right priorities, the central focus. We who know the Lord Jesus Christ tonight are looking for the author and the finisher of our faith. Just like the judges in the book of Samuel, our deliverer is coming. You have promised, Lord Jesus, to deliver us from the wrath to come. And we can only bow our heads and thank you that we will not have to live through what we humanly call hell unleashed on earth. By the same token, Father, we have children and we have grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And because we love them and because it grieves our heart to see them suffer, Father, we have to look to you for your merciful intervention. We ask that you would remind us that just as you graciously worked in our lives before we knew the Lord Jesus Christ, as the psalmist says, you redeemed our lives from destruction. In your gracious purposes, we cannot but believe that you will redeem the lives of our loved ones whom you are going to bring to Christ. You will redeem them from destruction. Help us to trust you that rather than trust what we understand, we can control, we think we can fix. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.